Alrighty, so welcome back. This is the second lecture for DE, and today we're going to be tackling systems of first order Ds. So this should be a lot of fun. It's actually a really cool section. So before we get to that though, let's knock out the homework from the last section and let's see what we have. So let me erase this a little more for me. All right. So we started off uh, number two from your book. So this is from section three, two. So we had, let's see, the number of people in of T, which is kind of a strange one instead of P of T, but okay, um, who are exposed to a particular advertisement is governed by the logistic equation. Initially, N at T equals zero equals 500. So that's the initial exposure to advertisements. And after one day, there are a thousand people that have been exposed to the advertisement. Okay. And so what it's asking us to do is to uh, solve uh, for N of T and uh, we want to know the number of people um, that, oh, we're just solving for N of T. Oh, okay. We're just trying to solve for N of T, and it's going to give us that the uh, max number of people that can see the, the advertisement is going to be 50K, so 50,000. All righty. So... It just wants an expression for n, so we can do that. Uh, first thing we're going to do is figure out what b is. So b, well, b is going to be your uh, max pot, so 50,000 minus your initial, minus 500, divided by your initial. And so that's going to give us a value of 99. Alrighty. And so now that we have uh, B, we can now use the initial condition that we're given right here, N of 1 is equal to 1,000, to figure out um, what our R is. So let's go ahead and do that. We're going to have our, ex our normal expression is going to be N of T is equal to K over 1 plus BERT. B e to the negative R T. Alrighty, so I've got N of T equals one. That's what that really stands for, right? It equals a thousand. So N of T is going to be a thousand, and it's going to equal K, which is fifty thousand, over one plus B, which is ninety nine, times E to the negative R, and then time is one, because the t equals one. Alrighty, so I'm gonna have a thousand times one plus 99e to the negative r is equal to 50,000. And then I'm going to divide both sides by a thousand and subtract one. And so I'm going to wind up with, let's see, 50,000 divided by 1,000, so that's going to be 1 plus 99e to the negative r is equal to 50, 99e to the negative r is equal to 49, and then r is going to equal, we're going to have the natural log of 49 divided by 99 divided by negative 1. So I'm going to divide 49 by 99 to get e by itself. Take the natural log of both sides, which is where this comes from. And when I do that, I'm going to be left with negative r equals the natural log of 49 over 99. And so I just divide both sides by negative 1. And so when I solve out, let me... Go grab that value from Excel. Okay, and so that value is approximately 0 
three, three. So it wants the expression. Let me see if I can squeeze it in right here. <laughs> I will attempt it. I'll start right here. N of T is equal to K, which is 50,000, over 1 plus 99 times E to the negative 0 0.7033 T. And hopefully you can see that. So this is my final expression right here. And that should be the answer. Alrighty. And so that was the first problem. Now let's go to the next problem. Let me clear this. Clear this. <laughs> okay, so this one was a problem that I just kind of pulled out of thin air. Uh, so we had 100 bacteria. And it's in a Petri dish um, that can sustain... 10 million bacteria. Alrighty. And we are given that the population at T equals 1 first hour. Yeah, that's the one I forgot to give you all in the actual video. It was in the comment section after the video, or I just put that is equal to 5,000. So we went from 100 bacteria at t equals 0 to 5,000 bacteria at t equals 1, which is insane growth. And so we are asked how long until... Oh, let's see. A, you have 5 million. B, 9,500,000. And then C, 9,999,999. Alrighty, so first thing as always to figure out what B is, not that B, but the equation we've got P of T is equal to K over 1 plus BERT, B E to the negative R T. Okay, so Let's see, B is going to equal, we're going to have our K minus P naught divided by P naught. So this is going to be 10 million minus the initial amount is 100 bacteria, and then that's going to be divided by 100. Okay? And when we do that, we're going to wind up with B is equal to 99,999. Alrighty, so that's pretty cool. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to solve for R, get our rate. So um, this should be a pretty big R. <laughs> this should be astronomically large because we went from 100 to 5,000 in a single time step. So I'm expecting a very large number. So... Let's see, we use the initial addition, 5,000 is equal to K, which is 10 million, divided by 1 plus B, 99,999, times E to the negative R, and then the time step was 1. Okay, so I'm going to get 5,000 times 1 plus 99999 e to the negative r is equal to 10 million. Alrighty, now I'm going to divide out, and when I do that, I'm going to get 1 plus 99999 e to the negative r is equal to, it's going to give me 2000 when I divide that out, so 2000. So 99999e nine, 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 nine. to the negative r is equal to 1999. That was a good year. So let's see. Now I'm going to divide out. I'm going to wind up with r 
is going to be approximately, well, it's going to be exactly, um, I'm going to have the natural log of 1999 divided by 99999 divided by the negative 1 in front of the R. And when I do that, I wind up with an R that is approximately, that's not an approximate sign. There we go, something like that. I get an R of, believe it or not, this is crazy, 3.9125. That's an astonishingly high rate. Um, most exponential growths that you see are uh, just decimals. Um, for it to be almost four is just an incredibly high. So um, for part A, we want to solve for how long it takes to reach uh, five million. So the way we do that, again, we set up our P of T, five million equals, we're going to have our K again, 10 million divided by 1 plus b e to the negative, we've got the r, 3.915t. That's what we're solving for. So we do the exact same procedure that we did to solve for r, except now we're solving for t. And when we do that, we wind up with t is equal to 2.94 hours. Wow. So we go from 100 to 5,000 and then 5,000 to 5 million. That is fast. Less than three hours later, it's at 5 million. Gosh. So then if I look at B, how long does it take to get to 9,500,000, well, it's exactly the same. I just changed this value to 9,500,000. And when I do that, I wind up with T is approximately, I should have an approximate right here, but it's not exact, uh, 3.7 hours. Okay, so we can see it's starting to slow down a little bit because it took not quite an hour to not quite double in size, whereas before, in a single hour, we had a 50 fold, 50 fold growth um, from the very beginning. So it, the resources are starting to limit uh, how fast it's growing. And, and that's what we expect because it should look something like if we, we see um, this kind of graphed out where this might be the, the K, the carrying capacity, the max pop. What we should see is an explosive growth that then slows down and approaches the asymptote. Something like that. Okay, so it should take off really fast and then slow down. Alrighty, and so let's for C, we want to know how long it takes it to go to 9,999,999, and we just changed again that value to that, and when we do that, we get a T is approximately 7.06 hours. And that makes a lot of sense. It takes uh, over three hours from the time it has 9,500,000 to get to 9,999,999. And that makes a lot of sense because as we uh, get towards the um, a uh, time, let's see how to say this, as we get to where the, um, the graph of the growth is um, approaching a horizontal asymptote, the growth rate is the amount that is, I shouldn't say growth rate because that's that's a constant, but um, the amount at which it can grow is um, heavily limited. And that was due to way back at the very beginning when we had our model, we had the model that said, if I can find it, we have, Let's see if I can squeeze that in somewhere. I'll put it in right here. I know this is getting kind of messy. So I'll just do this little corner. We had uh, DP, DT is equal to, and then we had the R times 
times p times 1 minus p over k. And so as p and k come really close to each other, you're getting a very small decimal that's multiplying the rate so that the rate uh, at which the population is changing, which is the dpdt, becomes extremely small. So I buy, I buy every one of these numbers. It's an explosive growth at the very beginning. It only takes less, less than three hours to get to um, half the max pop. And then it starts to slow down from that point on. So hope you enjoyed that. Um, now let's move on to the next section. What do you say? Let me clear this, and we're ready to go. There we go. Okay, so now let's get into 3.3, which is the systems of D. Systems of D. Alrighty, so here we go. Um, it turns out that uh, if you have systems where you have either interacting or competing rates, you can usually represent that system with a system of first order DEs, competing rates equals systems of DEs. Okay, so um, as an example, let's say that we have um, a radioactive decay series. So most of y'all are physics, so for the people who aren't physics, um, bear with me. We're going to be doing some physics for a little bit because this is amazing. Um, we're going to start off, let's do radioactive decay. All right, so if we have um, an element, something like maybe uranium-238, that will decay down to thorium-234. Okay, and as it decays, it gives off some energy, which is why it's a bad thing to have uranium-238 in your pocket. Um, it's throwing off a lot of gamma rays and other uh, things. Uh, matter of fact, I don't know exactly what the mechanism uh, for U-238 is. I'm, I'm guessing gamma is out there, but it might be emitting some other things, alpha particles and other horribleness. Regardless, it's throwing off things you don't want next to you um, in order to reduce its mass and get down to thorium-234. And so what will happen is it starts to decay. It goes from U-238 to thorium-234. And then here comes the chain. So I hope you all enjoy this. This is just astonishing how many reactions it has to go through. So it goes down from there to proactinium-234, one of my favorite uh, elements, proactinium. No, I've never used proactinium. I have no idea what it's used for or how stable it is. I'm guessing not very because I, I haven't heard of it much. So it then goes from there to uh, uranium-234. And then from uranium to thorium-230. So it's, it's gradually shedding mass as it goes. Um, then to radium-226. Uh, and then from there to radon, uh, 222. And this is why you do not want radon in your basement of your house. If you have a basement um, with lots of limestone nearby, <laughs> you might want to get a radon detector just to make sure because it's, it may start off as radon, but then it likes to throw out some energy and decay down to polonium 218. I don't know what the most common isotope for radon is, but it's definitely radioactive. Um, and then it goes down from there to astentine 218. And then from there, we go back to radon. 
218. And from there to lead, 214. And bismuth, 214. And it's still going. Polonium, 214. Oops, that's not a. Supposed to be a dash. And then from polonium to thallium. Where is that tantalum? I think that's tantalum. Wait, I think that's thallium. That's thorium. That must be thallium. Yeah, I think that's right. 210. Any chemistry or people that actually know their elements is probably cringing that I don't have all this down, but that's okay. And then from there to lead, 210. So um, it's getting less and less mass as it goes then from there to bismuth uh, 210 from there to polonium 210 Oops. and from there to mercury 206 and 10 i said that was Thallium, TL, I'll have to look that up, see which one that is. Uh, 206. And finally, to lead, 206. And that's where it's fairly stable. So, it starts off as uranium-238, and then gradually decays, changes into all these different isotopes of different elements, and finally winds up as a chunk of lead. Um, which I guess that's kind of cool. Uh, not kind of cool. That's extremely cool. Um, and the amount of energy that it had to jump to drop off to go from a mass uh, for the uranium to get down to lead is, is just staggering. Uh, and why did I do all this? Well, first off, this is amazing. If you haven't seen it before, I just want you to see it once in your life to just see how uh, unstable heavy elements become stable all the different transitions they go through it's just uh, staggering but the real reason is because um, in this is a system of competing and interacting rates I should say interacting rates really but they're not really competing um, so what happens is if I have uranium oops that was some stray marks uh, if I have uranium 238 And then it decays to thorium-234. That decay rate, and we're going to call it lambda. And we're going to say it's negative lambda sub 1. Okay? So it is, it is I guess you could call and say that from the perspective of the uranium, it is a decay, not a growth, if that makes sense. Okay? And then the thorium translates over to the proactinium. And it's going to have uh, a different rate. It, that decays down to the proactinium. Okay, so um, this is kind of not the full picture though, because at the same time that the thorium is decaying to the proactinium, thorium is also gaining from the decay of the uranium. So the way that we can describe this in a more abstract form is I can have things like um, x to y to z. And I've got a negative lambda 1 from this one and a negative lambda 2 from this one. And so what I can say is if I model this using differential equations, that the change 
in x with respect to time is equal to negative lambda 1 x. It is the rate times the amount of stuff that's in there. Okay. I can also say that the rate at which y is changing is now going to be a combination because I'm getting a lambda 1x added to it and then I'm subtracting off lambda 2y. And so it is y's amount that it has, the way its amount is changing is I'm getting stuff, a positive amount from the rate times the amount that's there, so it's the lambda 1 times x, and then I'm losing lambda 2 times the amount that's in y. And then finally, dz dt is going to equal, well, it only has one thing coming in, we're just saying that it stops at z, so that's going to be a positive lambda 2y. And so this is how you can kind of think of, of systems. Um, when I have y is an interaction between the amount of stuff that x is giving to it and the amount that it's losing to z, I model that just by a positive lambda 1x and a negative lambda 2y. And if you look at all this, it sort of balances out. It's, it's really nice. We've got a negative, positive, negative, positive. Um, that's kind of what you should have if you have a chain like this. So that's the way that you can um, model this kind of radioactive decay, where each one of these is going, thoriums is going to be, if this is lambda 1, it's going to be lambda 1 times the amount of uranium coming in minus, if this is lambda 2, the amount of lambda 2 times the amount of thorium there is. Proactinium is going to have a positive lambda 2 times the thorium and then minus lambda 3 times the amount of proactinium it has and so forth and so on until you get down to the very bottom. And this lead itself would just be lambda whatever times the amount of uh, thallium. And that's it. That's how it works. So that's the nice simple system. Um, and we're going to move on to a slightly more complicated one in the next example. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Let me clear the screen. So. Okay, so the next thing that we're looking at is going to be a more complicated system where we have um, vats of water that have different concentrations of salt in them. So we're going to start off. We have, we'll have to draw a diagram of this. You know what, let me go for a different color. We'll get creative this time. How about, um, let's go orange. No one likes orange, so we'll try that. So we're gonna have tank A, and it holds 50 gallons. And it starts off with 25 pounds of salt. Okay. And then we're going to have, let's do purple. Let's make this really horrible looking. A second tank for creativity, we'll call it B. It also holds 50 gallons. And it starts off with zero pounds of salt. Salt is not saddle. Alrighty. So, holy cow, that's a big eraser. My brush has just went nuts. So, let me draw that back in. Zero pounds of salt. Okay. Now, I'm going to have pure clear water coming in to tank A. And so 
this is going to be um, pure water. Oops, can't go up that high. So I'll just do it down here. Pure water, so um, three gallons a minute. And then uh, zero pounds of salt per gallon. Okay, so that's going to be pouring into here. And then from tank B, we're going to have coming from it, it's going to feed into tank A. And it's going to be one gallon per minute. Okay, then tank A is going to be outputting to tank B. It's going to be outputting four gallons per minute. And finally, the output from tank B, it's just going to be pouring out and it is going to be pouring out at three gallons per minute. Alrighty, so we're going to call the amount of salt in tank A is going to be X1. So X1 equals the amount of salt in tank A. Okay, X2 is going to be the amount of salt in tank B. Okay, so what we want to do is come up with a set of differential equations that describe the system. And it's going to be very similar to the radioactive uh, decay that we just went over. So um, we're going to start off with, let's do uh, dx1 dt. So dx1 dt is going to be the rate at which, you know what, let me do one thing real quick. I'm going to make that a little bit smaller because I want to get everything on here without having to change pages. I want to keep this picture up. So let me try that again. Let me come over here and go a little bit smaller. <laughs> a little bit smaller. DX1 DT. Okay. Well, I have coming into it three gallons a minute. So it's going to equal, that's going to be a positive value, so it's going to be uh, 3 gallons per minute, gallons per min, uh, that doesn't look like a gallon, gallons per min, okay, times, well, how, what is the salt concentration? Well, that's 0 pounds per gallon. Okay. I'm also getting in stuff that's flowing from tank B. So that's flowing in at a rate of one gallon per minute. One gallon per minute. And then that's going to be times. What is the salt concentration? Well, the amount of salt is x2 divided by 50. That is the amount of salt per gallon, the amount of pounds of salt per gallon. So uh, pounds per gallon. Okay, so it's an x2 right there. Okay, so that's what's being added to tank A. What's being taken away? Well, what's being taken away is it's leaving uh, tank A at a rate of 4 gallons per minute. So this is going to be a minus, and then we'll have 4 gallons a minute. 4 gallons per minute. And then how much salt is in there? Well, that one's going to be X1, the total amount of pounds of salt, divided by 50 gallons, pounds per gallon. Okay, and there we have it. That 
is going to set up the um, rate at which the salt the amount of salt in tank one is changing. Now we can do the same thing with tank two. And it should be a lot easier because we'll already have some of these values set up already. Um, first thing is that it is gaining four gallons a minute from tank A. And we already know what that should look like. It should be this amount right here, four gallons per minute, X1 over 50 pounds per gallon, but it should be a positive value. So this is just going to be positive four gallons per minute times x1 over 50 pounds per gallon. Okay? And so that's all that's going into tank B. Tank B going out, well, we have this one gallon a minute. But that is exactly what we have right here, except now it's going to be negative. So minus one gallon per minute times x2 over 50 pounds per gallon. Okay, and finally, three gallons per minute is going out. And what does that look like? Well, that's going to be three gallons per minute. And then what is the concentration? Again, it's going to be x2 over 50 pounds per gallon. bracket. Okay. Now, this is how you set everything up, but it turns out this is not the best form to keep in because it's still kind of obscuring the system that I was talking about. So what we want to do is we want to take these values right here and kind of combine them all to make a system of equations. So I wish I had room to put it underneath, but I don't. So I'm just going to have to uh, kind of go to the next page, but instead of just going to a blank page, I want to keep this and kind of erase what I have up here at the top. So if you will bear with me, I'm going to clear that. So let's see, I turn that up. Just erase all this stuff. Just like I'm in a classroom on a board. Alrighty. So let's make this a little bit easier to handle. Let's go. Let's work with dx1 first. So dx1 dt is equal to. So when I multiply this out, the gallons are going to cancel. I'm going to have zero pounds per minute coming in. So this is going to be, if you will, zero, uh, actually let me make that a different zero. Let's go with zero gallons per minute. My path, gallons, my goodness, I've got gallons on my brain. Pounds per minute of salt coming in from the fresh water. Okay, which isn't going to be anything. Plus, now gallons are going to cancel here and I'm going to be left with x2 over 50 and then again this is going to be pounds per minute and then minus 4 over 50 which is going to reduce to 2 you know what I want to keep it as 4 over 50 for right now because that won't obscure it 4 over 50 times x1 uh, pounds per minute. Okay. So when the dust settles, I'm going to wind up with dxd1 is equal to, I'm going to have 1 over 50 x2 minus 4 over 50 x1 which I'm going to change the order of that. So I'm going to wind up with four over 50 negative X one plus one over 50 X two. That right there 
is the first equation I want. Now to get to the next one, dx2 dt. Okay, I'm going to do the same process. So I'm going to wind up with, uh, if you will let me shortcut it, this is just going to be 4 over 50 x1, 4 over 50 x1. And then I've got 1 over 50 x2. So minus 1 over 50 x2 minus 3 over 50 x2, which when I combine them together is going to give me 4 over 50 x1 minus 4 over 50 x2. And this is my second equation. So now I have two equations, two unknowns, and I can solve them. Uh, we're not going to solve them here because we don't have the techniques yet to solve them, but um, in D2, which I sincerely hope a lot of the physicists stick around for because it's uh, you'll see a lot of the things you'll see in grad school and um, in other places if you keep going on to DE2 because that's when some of the uh, really fun stuff kicks in. Um, not that DE1 isn't also fun, but this is it. So we took that crazy system of tanks. We kind of played around with how to set up everything in a nice orderly manner down here. And once all the dust settles, we wind up with these two nice equations that describe the rate of change of tank 1's amount of salt and the rate, the, uh, rate at which tank 2's amount of salt is changing as well. So there you go. Moving on to the next one then. Let me clear this. Okay, so we have done the simple exponential growth and decay models to kind of model uh, predator prey stuff, but let's do a more complicated, more interesting one. So this is going to be a predator prey model. And it's a cool one. This is some of the stuff that you will see if you take math models. You'll actually do some of this stuff. Sorry, physicists normally don't take that, but the math people all get to enjoy all these predator prey models that pop up in uh, the math models class. So here we go. So this is going to be a very simplified model. Um, it's just a simple system of two species. So we're going to have foxes and rabbits. It could be anything but foxes and rabbits. That's something that most people are okay with, with visualizing. Um, so in this system, the rabbits only eat grass. And the foxes, well, they only eat rabbits. Only eat rabbits. I know it's bad, but, you know, it's nature, so I don't see many uh, foxes eating grass, so there you go. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to represent foxes, the uh, population of the foxes, as x of t. It's going to be the population of the fox, so the pop of the foxes. And y of t is going to be the pop of the rabbits. Okay. Now, here we go. Let me turn the page in my notes. So if we're talking about the foxes and just the foxes, uh, no rabbits involved. So, um, if there are no rabbits for the foxes to eat, then x of t will decline. x of t will decline. Decline. And the how it's going to decline is going to be 
dx dt is equal to negative a x. A is going to be the rate of decline. And then in it's however many foxes are out there, that's going to decide how many, what the rate is that they die off at. Lots of foxes means it's going to be a high die off rate. If they're just a few foxes, it's not going to be as high. So the change won't be as much. Okay. Now, this is going to seem kind of strange, but um, the amount, the rate at which um, the fox population grows is not only due to the amount of foxes, but also the amount of rabbits. So what we're going to do is say that the interaction between the foxes and the rabbits. We're going to say that's a product. It's going to be some sort of uh, product between the two. So equals a product. Okay. And then we're going to have some uh, proportional rate. So the interaction between foxes and rabbits is a product. And we're going to say that uh, for the fox population now, if we include the rabbits, well, it dies off if there are no rabbits. So minus a x, but then it grows based on the interaction between the number of foxes and the number of rabbits with a rate b. So this is what describes um, how the population of the foxes change. It's got a uh, negative, a, a decay element for when the foxes can't find the rabbits, when there's no food around. And then it grows based on um, the amount of foxes and the amount of rabbits. So if the amount of rabbits is really small, it's not going to grow very much. Uh, if the amount of foxes is really small, it's not going to grow very much. But if you have a lot of foxes and a lot of rabbits, then you're going to get large increase into the, the rate at which the fox population is growing. So this is going to be our first equation right here, and it's going to describe the foxes. And now we need to do the same thing to describe the rabbits. So let's go to the next page for that. So for this one, um, if we're going to start off with the same type of assumptions, if there are no foxes, the rabbits population is going to grow, right? population grows. Okay, and so we're going to give that um, some value. So we're going to say that dy dt is equal to uh, some delta rate times the number of rabbits that are there. It is a positive value because it is a growth, not a decay. So the, the rate at which the rabbit population is changing is due to the number of rabbits times this factor, whatever it is, the delta. Okay. Now, we also have to say if we include the foxes now, hello kitty cat, one of my cats is coming over to say hi. So if we include the foxes, now we're going to say that the rate at which the rabbit's population changes is going to equal, well, we're going to have, it's growing for the grass eating, but it is being subtracted by the interaction of 
the foxes and the rabbit. So we're going to have minus c times x times y. So cxy. Okay. So now we have the second equation. And the first one, just to reiterate, was dx dt is equal to, we had um, negative ax plus bxy. So the rabbit's population declines if there are a whole bunch of rabbits, uh, a, whole bu a whole bunch of rabbits, a whole bunch of foxes. Um, you're going to get a, a large drop in the population, so the rate's going to be pretty steep. And if you have a few rabbits or, or a few foxes, or vice versa, I keep doing that, uh, you're going to wind up having a slow um, decay, and the growth may actually outpace it. So these two, again, set up a system of equations um, where um, you can solve out and figure out exactly how the rates are, are affecting uh, the populations over time. It's, it's absolutely amazing when you actually get to solve these things and you get to graph them out and watch uh, as it approaches some sort of weird steady state based on rates. Uh, so there you go. That is kind of what we have uh, for a new uh, set of interacting um, systems. So. There you go. That is the next one. And the last one that we're going to be covering today is going to be a slightly more complicated version of this, but where we actually have a max pop. So we have a carrying capacity that we have to take into consideration as well. So let's try that one now. Clear the screen. Okay, so now let's say that we have a system where we have two competing populations, so uh, two competing populations, and each one has a maximum capacity, a max population, okay? So if I look back to the uh, logistic equation, the differential equation that originally was used to derive it, to derive it was the change in population over time was equal to some rate times the amount of the population times, now here's the limiting factor, 1 minus P over K. Okay. Now, if I multiply the RP through, I'm going to get equals RP minus RP squared over K, which I'm going to rewrite as R times P minus R over K times P squared. And so what we have here is a uh, linear growth and a nonlinear uh, limitation on the growth. Okay, so if I take this type of model and apply it to uh, my two competing populations, let me go ahead and do that over here. I could say I have something that looks like um, dx dt, where x is the population of the first. One so x equals number one and y is going to equal number two. Okay, and so I would have for this one an a x minus b x squared growth minus the limitation from the max population and then minus the interaction between the two populations because they're both competing for resources, okay? The second population 
it's going to be very, very similar. I'm going to have a different rate. So I would have something like a delta y minus e y squared minus f x y. So this one, again, has growth. That's exponential, unbounded, but with a limiting factor for the max for the actual population, the, the carrying capacity, and then minus the interaction between the two species, some rate. So um, this is how you would model that type of, of, of situation right here. And it's, again, something we can't solve yet, but we'll be able to take a look at as we get up into uh, part two of DE, which is, again, one of the reasons why I really, really recommend it. It's some fun stuff. So with that said, that is everything from 3.3, and now I can give you homework. So let's see. Okay, so the homework is going to be from 3.3. And it's going to be numbers one and five. And so um, number one is asking you to model a, um, a decay chain. We are going to have um, x, y, and z elements. And we're going to have the rate from x to y is going to be lambda one. And from lambda, from y to z is going to be lambda 2. Those are going to be the rates. And then um, we set up dx dt is going to be negative lambda 1 x. And then dy dt is going to be positive lambda 1 x minus lambda 2 y. And then finally, dz, dt is just going to be positive lambda to y, right? So we're going to have initial conditions. We're going to say that uh, x at t equals 0 is x naught. And then y at t0 is 0. And z at t equals zero is zero. Okay, so what they want you to do in number one is to solve, get explicit ex uh, expressions for x, y, and z. And so you start off, uh, you want to get an explicit expression for x using this equation. So we've got dx dt is equal to negative lambda one x. Uh, we can actually solve this. That's just a separation of variables. So uh, to solve for x, to get x of t equals, you're going to do separation of variables. And then the same type of thing will happen when you're solving for z. It's going to be very complicated, though, because in order to figure out what this dz dt is, I need an expression for y. So you can't solve y until you have an expression for x. You can't solve z until you have an expression for y. So um, the dy dt is lambda 1x minus lambda 2y. And so um, your lambda 1x, this x right here, is the value that you get when you solve for this. So this x of t, whatever that expression is, it's going to go right there. And you're going to use all of this. And you can't use separation of variables for this, but you can do dun 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 dun, dun the integrating factor method to solve for y. So that's the mu is equal to e to the integral of p of x dx, that whole one. So you use that to figure out what y is equal to. And then you use the, that y of t 
for this y, and there's separation of variables again. So um, it gets pretty complicated, but it's it's not too terribly horrible. Give it a, a try. At least do um, the very first one, separation of variables, and attempt part two. It, lo it looks bad, but it's not as bad as it looks. And then number five, just as a heads up, is very similar to what you do in number one, except you're going to have um, a much, much simpler system. And once you get the solutions that are explicit, you can then do some actual um, problems, some really cool problems to see, um, for example, in the, as t goes to infinity, um, what percentage of each element you'll have after a decay series ends. So kind of cool. So anywho, y'all have a good one and good luck with the homework and with all your other physics stuff. I know some of y'all are swamped right now. So um, I will see you next video.